Most laws, the overwhelming majority of the laws in Europe and North America, are not just insane, social socialistic, useless, and so on and so forth, but fundamentally immoral. Which is why an argument such as, but, 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 but it's the law, is completely and utterly meaningless. Not everything that's illegal is immoral, and not everything that's legal is also moral. The law is not, and cannot be, an arbiter of morality. Worshipping at the altar of the law is a losing strategy for normal and sane people. Abiding by insane laws instead of breaking them is the behavior of a slave. Let's explore! Hello everyone and welcome to another installment of Freedom Alternative Research and Analysis. Alright, now I sounded a bit more radical and perhaps even edgy than I probably intended in the intro, but the topic of this episode is a very serious one. For many years there was a sort of a consensus, a fragile one admittedly, but a consensus nonetheless. The consensus was that all sides of the political spectrum would fight viciously in words and arguments on what is best to organize government, but at the same time all sides would abide by the laws resulted from that process and also at least loosely respect several basic things such as property rights, freedom of speech and a few other things depending on the country, jurisdiction or historical period. Now that consensus was not continuous, it was interrupted multiple times, either because of war or because one or more sides of the political spectrum had become insane. Well, it is my contention that this is, this is exactly what is going on today, with the left going full insane and the right still living in the fantasy land that the aforementioned consensus still exists. Now allow me to explain. First of all, it is hard for many conservatives to even consider my points on this issue because conservatives are far more prone to think laws are good and be much more firm in the belief that the rule of law is much better than the rule of men. Now, while that it is true and there is plenty of evidence in that direction, it is also true that there is past wisdom that should guide conservatives whenever the rule of law gets perverted. 19th century American essayist Henry David Thoreau, known more for his phrase that government is best which governs not at all, also said if the machine of government is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then I say break the law. There is also an even older quote commonly attributed to Thomas Jefferson, although there is serious doubt on whether he actually said it, that says that if a law is unjust, a man is not only right to disobey it, he is obligated to do so. There is also more recent, contemporary conservative and libertarian wisdom to the same effect, including with practical politics advice. Now, I know I recommended this book before, but for newer subscribers, I'll direct uh, you again to it. Charles Murray, By the People, Rebuilding Liberty Without Permission. It's a fantastic book with, trip, with tips and tricks, most of them applicable not just in the States, but all over Europe, North and South America, Australia, and many other places. Now, there is a reason I started with examples from the past and with Charles Murray's book. To show that what I'm about to suggest throughout this video is not exactly a new idea, nor is it extreme. In fact, civil disobedience and skepticism of the government and immoral laws was, and will forever be, part of the liberty movement. What did you guys think the Tea Party movement was about? Anyway. Now that we have established where these ideas come from, let's take a few examples of ridiculously insane laws and policies that should absolutely be disregarded. Not more than a week ago, a man woke up, walked to his car located on his own property, turned down the engine and then went back in the house to get dressed, hoping that his car will be warm enough by the time he actually has to drive away from his home to his workplace or whatever. 
Well, the car was warm by the time he got back, but he also had a $128 fine on it for leaving the keys in his contact and the car unattended on his own property. Now, this happened in Roseville, Michigan, the United States, and the police chief was adamant about it, insisting that the law is just and, in fact, commonsensical. Apparently, warming up your car because it's minus 20 degrees Celsius outside and you would prefer to drive with a much more acceptable temperature in your car somehow drives crime rates up. I'm not joking. Here's the full statement of James Berlin, the police chief of Roseville. Quote, We have 5 to 10 cars stolen this way every winter, Roseville police chief James Berlin said. It's dangerous and of course it drives everyone's insurance rates up. It drives our crime rates up. Berlin tells Seven Action News they will not apologize and in fact he encourages his officers to enforce this law. It's common sense. We can't warn everybody of the law there is. Common sense says you don't leave your car unattended, Berlin said. So, using the logic of this law, we're just gonna punish the potential victims, just in case. From where I'm standing, the only criminal here seems to be the police itself, which trespassed on this man's property to observe his keys and then write the ticket and make sure he's not seen. Now you tell me, is this a law or a policy or ordinance or whatever worth defending and obeying? Or rather, a sample of absolute insanity that should be protested, actively disregarded and eventually outright ignored? As far as I'm concerned, only someone mired in a literal slave mentality can defend such nonsensical legislation. Any legislation that proposes the breaking of one's property for no reason other than the whim of the government is, by the book, immoral. Now, was anyone harmed by this guy's worming his car? Of course not. Millions of people do this every day everywhere in the world during winter time, including in the state of Michigan. If this had been such a harmful practice for third parties, it would have stopped being done a long time ago. You know, there was a time when people wouldn't put locks on their doors. It didn't last long because experience dictated that it's better to have them. There is no law forcing you to have one, but you do have one nonetheless. Some, see, the same principle kind of applies here too. If direct experience of individuals and communities had shown that this is a bad practice, it would have been corrected by now, or at least the correction would have been incentivized via market means, such as through tweaks in the prices of insurance premiums. All right. Two more examples, and then we'll get uh, to the philosophical points. Maybe we can wrap this one up in less than one hour. <laughs> Example number two. Almost three years ago, a man was arrested on a Swedish beach for being too muscular under an insanely idiotic law that prohibits steroids use even in civilians who don't engage in sports or other activities where they could be held liable for cheating, although even then it shouldn't be grounds for arrest. Now, despite the fact that the guidelines of the law prohibited arresting someone just on a hint of their muscles, the state disregarded its own guidelines, as it always happens in overregulated societies, and picked up this chap anyway. Now, it turns out that he was using steroids and the DA inferred that he might be a dealer too. That allegation was never proven, but since Sweden is a place which only pretends to have a, a rule of law, but in fact is a demokratur, not really different from Saudi Arabia or Uganda in terms of state persecution and de facto lawlessness, he was sentenced to 21 months in jail. His girlfriend was also sentenced to 18 months in jail just because the judge could do it. The argument against her? She could not possibly not know that her boyfriend might have been dealing steroids. Again, no evidence, just the feeling of the prosecutor. Not joking. Now, not only is this case an absolute travesty of what we normally understand to be a system of a rule of law, but it's an absolute travesty on an absolutely immoral law to begin with. If you can't even own your own body, then what exactly do you own anymore in Sweden? 
And the answer is easy, nothing. Because Sweden is no longer a capitalist society with property rights and the rule of law. It's a socialist bubble at the mercy and the whims of the state. Now you tell me, should such a system ever be considered good enough to respect it? From where I'm standing, the answer is self-evident and it's a resounding no. And mind you, this is not a singular case. Muscle profiling is actually a thing in Sweden. If you thought the American war on drugs is insane, you probably haven't seen Sweden. Alright, last example, throughout 2016, but especially during the summer, the German federal police, the Bundespolizei, conducted numerous raids in numerous private homes all across the nation. Now, was this a coordinated effort to find arms dealers? Nope. Was it a coordinated effort to tackle some child exploitation sex ring? Nope. Maybe it was an effort to crack down on the organized pedophile networks that exist particularly amongst former and current Green Party members and sympathizers? Nope. So, why all this mobilization? Facebook comments. No, seriously. Facebook comments, particularly comments which deviated from the Politburo's approved opinion on diversity, progress, cultural enrichment, and, of course, the religion of peace. Now you tell me, is such a system worthy of being respected? Is such a law worthy of abiding by? Or rather, it's a law that should absolutely be broken, ridiculed, broken again, and the state trolled into oblivion until this lunacy goes away. I know my answer. I even applied my answer here when the Social Democrats wanted to introduce the infamous defamation law, which would have been a copy-paste from the ludicrous cucked laws that many countries in the former Western bloc have. Now, I defamed every single member of the Social Democrat Party, both in private and in public, and I called up my friends to help me as well, and they're friends of friends. I also pledged on this channel to take a shit and wipe my ass with the ticket should I ever get one for the things I say on this channel, and then post the video on the internet alongside with my kindest regards for the Social Democrats and my utmost respect for all the cretins who might think such a law is a good idea. I still keep that pledge, though it will have to wait since the Social Democrats have had a change of heart since then probably being cursed by two or three million people every day, 24 hours per day, was good enough to make the point about how unpopular such an idea is. But should they get this idea in their tiny and usually empty heads again, I'll get right back at it. Because if a law is unjust, I don't give two hoots over how important the law is. If it's unjust, I'd rather be moral and a criminal than be a law-abiding slave to an unjust system. Alright, now that we've had some examples, we can scale back the rhetoric a little bit, <laughs> but not by much, and look a bit into the philosophy of all of this, by which I mean giving you my opinion, and then we'll look into practical politics. So, beyond all the rhetoric, the basic point that I'm trying to convey is that we as conservatives must adopt a more warrior-like attitude. Our philosophical opponents are a lot more honest and straightforward about what they believe. They don't care about the law. Maybe they did 50 or 60 years ago, but they don't care about it today. Leftists have no problem endorsing violence against people who disagree with them and have no problem defending even the most horrifying criminals and even terrorist organizations if it fits their narrative. Now, I'm not saying we should do the same, but I am saying we should bloody be less afraid in breaking stupid laws and advocate for the spread of such practices. Now, this sounds scarier than it actually is, <laughs> but I'll get to specifics in the last part of the video. Although I'm sure this segment will be quoted out of context someday in the future, but then again, they'll do that to anyone, so <clears throat> why even bother? Anyway, the thing is that many conservatives, and especially libertarians, even today, are reluctant to advocate in a non-leftist way. It's almost as if many of us are afraid to be brutal. And I'm talking here specifically about folks like us, normal everyday people, not the politicians. For example, let's take freedom of association. This is a right that has been steadily eroded in too many countries and jurisdictions in ways that are completely unacceptable. 
Yet the defense for this right is thin even amongst, uh, amongst everyday people, even though everyday people are the most affected by its erosion. Another example, privacy. A right recognized widely in the Western world, yet rarely enforced and very rarely defended. And when it is defended, it's left to traitors and dubious deviants. In Europe, there is the EU Data Protection Directive, and in the United States, there is the Fourth Amendment, or I should say, there was a Fourth Amendment. Just a few days ago, the Obama administration just expanded the scope and reach of the infamous Executive Order 12333 and now opens up the NSA's huge database to anyone and everyone in the loosely and never defined intelligence community. Any conservative outrage on that? Well, not really. To be fair, not much liberal outrage either, but then again, liberals wouldn't say anything bad about Obama, even if their lives depended on this. These are things that really do matter, yet very few touch on them for fear of not being seen extremist or anarchist or an advocate for lawlessness. Yet it, it is precisely this overregulation and state power run amok that creates law lawlessness. Because when everyone is a criminal under at least one statute, ordinance, law or policy, then do we really have a rule of law, or rather, the rule of men? Think about it. The quote of Cardinal Richelieu with, if you give me six lines written by the hand of the most honest of men, I will find something in them with which will hang him. This quote applies impeccably to our allegedly modern societies. In most countries of Europe and in North America, 100% of the people are criminals. Most of them don't know it and are not that important, so the state doesn't go after them, but should any of them become relevant enough, the state can go after them with impunity. Is this any different from the lawlessness that emerges in a totalitarian state where the whims of the dictator is the law until the dictator changes his mind? It doesn't make much of a difference the fact that there are more little dictators in various regulatory agencies and alphabet soup institutions instead of just one dictator like in past examples. It's still a dictatorship. That is why I have very little time for arguments like, yeah, but you know, this is the law of the land. Well, fuck you, fuck your law and fuck your land. If something is immoral, I'll call it out and then proceed to do as I please with or without your disdainful law. All right, now, on to practical politics. Now, what I propose is nowhere near as radical as the rhetoric I used in this video so far. And as I said, I draw my inspiration from the book I recommended earlier, By the People, Rebuilding Liberty Without Permission by Charles Murray. And it's something that I've been doing since, well, almost since forever. I never had much respect for the law and probably never will since I deem more than 90% of my country's laws to be either utterly immoral or simply useless. Basically, what I'm advocating is that when you see a law that smells like bullshit, that is to say, when you see virtually any law passed in the last 50 to 80 years, instead of asking yourself, all right, let's see, how can I comply? Ask the naughty questions. Is this law moral or not? The answer will be no most of, almost every time. And then ask yourself this, how can I break this law and do as I please whilst creating minimum damage to myself? In other words, I'm advocating for a shift in mentality from the law is mostly good mentality to the law is mostly insane. Or a shift from uh, what we were taught or what we feel things ought to be towards reality. Yes, it would be great if most laws were good, necessary, clear, and moral. But that's simply not true, and hasn't been for decades. Now, leftists know that because they changed most of them, but too many on the right have failed to catch up with this reality. All right, let's give some examples. For instance, I recently learned that in my country it is forbidden by law to cut down a walnut tree, even if that tree is on your property and perhaps you or your parents planted it years or decades ago. In other words, I just learned that I'm a criminal since I cut down two such trees from my property a few years ago. Apparently, the law has been in place for at least a decade. 
Now, thankfully, in this country, most people think like me, namely that anything outside the old penal code is treated the way we treated communist laws, namely as a rumor unanimously passed by the National Assembly that no one really cares about to begin with. Now, with such a population, it is harder for the state to enforce such nonsense, which the government openly admits that it's impossible to enforce this particular law. But what if this weren't the case? What if I had lived in a place where people give a damn about immoral laws and insist everyone else gives a damn too? Here's a somewhat similar example. A man in Wyoming built a pond on his own property alongside his wife for their kids to play in it. He even followed the already existent insane rules that exist for such things in the state of Wyoming. Yet that wasn't enough. The EPA, that would be the Environmental Protection Agency, came down on his property and demanded the, the pond be destroyed because it breaches some bullshit statute. It took him over two years, since January 2014 till May 2016, to finally settle the matter and keep his pond. Now, this guy was tough and defiant and had no problem telling the EPA to go fuck themselves multiple times, publicly de declare he won't give them a dime in their bullshit fines, and was determined enough to defend his absolute right to build whatever he damn pleases on his property, as long as he doesn't affect non-consenting parties, which he absolutely was not. Now, Imagine that instead of one pond, there would be five million ponds. Would the EPA be able to enforce their bullshit statutes? The answer is no. It would throttle their bureaucracy and effectively abolish the law by practice. This is basically what Charles Murray is advocating. Civil disobedience and forcing bureaucracies to back down and abolish laws by practice and by fighting back by suing them into oblivion, and yes, by bullying them. He talks in the book about a case in which one of his organizations sponsored a series of cases against a bureaucrat from the DEA who fined the waitress for failing to ask an ID from one of her customers before selling alcohol to that customer. Now, the customer was her father. Yet that didn't matter, because the DEA is full of insane people who pray to the altar of the law in spite of common sense. Alright, but you will say, okay, this kind of makes sense, maybe, but what can I do? Because after all, we're not all Charles Murray to have a law firm at our disposal to fight back. And that's a fair point, although I would indicate that in most of Europe you don't actually need one. Uh, I sued the police uh, once or twice and won every single time without an attorney. Now, admittedly, it is a lot harder in the United States, but it's not impossible. What everyone watching this needs to remember is that all politics is local. Well, almost all. But the majority of state interference that really pisses any sane person off is the result of local bureaucrats enforcing local ordinances or laws passed by other bureaucrats with too much time on their hands. And here, I should probably plug again the video I made in December about the Deep State. Those of you who haven't seen that video, please do so, because the Deep State connects very well with what I'm about to say in this final portion of the video. Now, considering that we're still in the awareness phase and the uh, there is a mountain of work ahead of us, everyone listening to this should keep in mind that miracles don't exist, and as such, one should set small, realistic, and accomplishable goals. For instance, on the issue of privacy, you can't really change the NSA, and this is especially true for those most affected by it, namely the rest of us without an American passport. But you can claim more of your right to privacy if you start learning about encryption and simply adopt a more conservative behavior. For this, I would reference my older video, Conservatism as Applied to Technology. Now, you don't have to be paranoid like me, though it would be recommended, but it pains me whenever I see people who should know better bundling services and using technology irresponsibly as if privacy were a given, when in reality it simply isn't unless you take steps to protect it. 
but it goes beyond technology. Making sure the state knows as little as possible about you is mostly about behavior. When you're approached, for instance, by a promoter to give your name and a phone number to maybe win some nonsense product, the appropriate answer is no. And if the promoter insists, as they sometimes do, the appropriate comeback is no, fuck off. With private databases now essentially at the disposal of not just your government, but most governments, it is insane per se to allow your private information to be so freely available. Basically, take more responsibility for your rights because the law is useless. The law is your enemy, not your friend, and it arguably never has been your friend in certain jurisdictions. Same goes with freedom of association. Rigorously enforce it for you and your friends. I, for instance, refuse to associate with a lot of people and never make a secret of the fact that I'm very proud of why and how I discriminate. You know, Meryl Streep, as stupid and vacuous as her speech was, did say one thing that was true, namely that when you do something boldly enough, it gives permission, in a metaphorical sense at the very least. Many people today censored themselves more than anything else. When you come out and say, no, I won't associate with that individual because he's a leftist and leftists are evil. That gives permission to those around you. It brings out others who thought similarly but never had the courage to express it. Remember, our position is the majority position almost everywhere, including in places you wouldn't expect, like Sweden or even California. On freedom of association, the conservative position is the absolute norm even amongst those who are adamantly leftist. These days we've seen leftists starting to rediscover freedom of association, which is fine, because that means it's easier to sell it to even more people. Now I'll make a separate video about those who profess leftism but live as conservatives. There's a whole discussion about those kinds of people as well. Other things, other things that you could do uh, to rebuild liberty without permission, use your newly created circle to lobby local institutions. Now, this cannot be stressed enough. Most politics is local and very few people get involved. This means you stand a good chance of winning on most issues. I said in the video about the economic effects of divorce that I published on January the 14th, I think, were also advocated for rebuilding bottom-up civic institutions. I said there about how um, I use my knowledge to compel a school to drop its plans of introducing Marxist, feminist, LGBT, alphabet soup, friendly education. It was really me and two friends from my little circle arguing against two fembots. We wiped the floor with them and saved the day flawlessly. This is how most of these battles go. Now, admittedly, these aren't spectacular nor popular, but they move things to our direction or successfully prevent them from moving away from our direction, which was my case. But this can be applied to anything. Does the city hall plan to give money on the Bolshevik holiday of International Women's Day? Go there and argue against it. You won't win at your first attempt, unless you're in Eastern Europe or in a city that is already struggling economically, in which case you can argue on budget quite efficiently, but you will win the second time. Many of these subversive local policies exist precisely because nobody bothered to oppose them in the first place. For instance, a fr few friends of mine convinced several city halls in this country to scale down almost all of their March 8 manifestations under the threat that if they don't, they will sue them into oblivion until they provide the exact same amount for the International Men's Day. Now, International Men's Day on November 19th is a legally recognized holiday in this country. Now, neither me nor my friends wanted funds for the MRAs. We wanted to see funds cut from the feminists. You just have to play the culture right and believe me, it works. Basically, use the law against them. Force them to live up by their own rules. And if this sounds Alinsky to you, that's because it is. Other things that you should consider doing. Build an inform informal organization and pull stunts. 
For instance, some friends of mine somewhere in Europe, I won't say more because I don't want to ruin their plans, have done such thing. They use their organization to clean up the streets faster and cheaper than the city hall and successfully blackmailing the city hall to scale down the local taxes since their efficiency has been proven to be crap. The end game is to abolish a few of the local taxes that these friends of mine deemed insane or to raise hell and start a local referendum on them, which would absolutely pass anyway. And the city officials know it and they also know that in a referendum more things can be demanded and would be worse for their careers and prestige. This tactic works on many things. The basic principles are to make yourself appear much larger and much more influential than you actually are, and then use that image to bully the authority into compliance. However, make sure you have ways to deliver on your threats and be ready to deliver. Most bureaucrats in various city halls and school councils um, and do, not, do not really expect such thing to happen. That's why hell raising works. I still remember how shocked were the officials of one or two high schools in this country when they met me. <laughs> one high school got shut down because they pissed off a friend of mine and abused their power. When I told them to knock it off, because otherwise we'll raise hell, they said, we'll do it. And we did it. But then, and this is important, I refused to back down, even though they had all crawled into submission begging for forgiveness. I didn't stop until I saw all of them purged. Why? Because it's important for track record setting. You only have to do this once in a decade or so. Then the mere implication to the next target that you'll do the same will be enough to get them to do what you want. Again, these are things that leftist ideologues pull on the local level on a regular basis. And I, recommended, I recommend these tactics precisely because they work. Anyway. There's a long discussion on this, which is why I made it a mission for this year to include practical politics advice in as many videos as possible, because it's time to start fighting back. And the mindset is really everything. If you start with, your mi with the mindset that the law is your friend and that you're dealing with reasonable people, you already lost. The law is not your friend, it's merely a tool currently used by your opponents. And no, most bureaucrats are not reasonable, and in fact, they're explicitly unreasonable most of the time. And until we infiltrate the deep state, these tactics are necessary and highly efficient. Alright, I'll definitely talk more about these, maybe I'll even make a separate video on local activism, we'll see. But until then, thank you for watching and uh, please do tell me in the comments what other tactics you have in mind or what other tactics have you tried successfully and where. Now, I'm not interested in the exact location, but the country would suffice. Let's get this ball rolling because we have some cultural momentum on our side and not using this opportunity would be a big shame. And with that said, thank you once again for sticking around. Many thanks to those who financially support this channel. You guys are really amazing. And uh, I'll see you soon on Freedom Alternative.